Down through the centuries, Christians have used all sorts of symbols to convey to others that they are followers of Jesus Christ. Some of these symbols include the cross, the sign of the fish, an anchor, a lamb, a, a lion, a shepherd, and the alpha and the omega, which are the first and last letters of the Greek alphabet. Concerning these symbols of Christianity, these and others, Francis Schaeffer wrote these words in his classic book, The Mark of the Christian. He said, through the centuries, men have displayed many different symbols to show that they are Christians. They have worn marks in the lapels of their coats, hung chains around their necks, even had special haircuts. Of course, there's nothing wrong with any of this if one feels it is his calling, but there is a much better sign, a mark that has not been thought up just as a matter of expediency for use on some special occasion or in some specific era. It's a universal mark that is to last through all the ages of the church till Jesus comes back. So what is that universal mark that Francis Schaeffer is talking about? It's the one Jesus told his disciples about in John chapter 13. Let me read to you what Jesus said, starting in verse 33. He said, little children, I'm with you a little while longer. You will, see, you will seek me, and as I said to the Jews, now I say also to you, where I'm going, you cannot come. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, even as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. Now, Jesus gave these words to his disciples in his farewell address, also known as the upper room discourse, knowing that he was about to be arrested later that night and crucified the next day, Jesus sought to prepare his men for what life would be without his physical presence. One of the things he wanted them to know was that he was leaving them a command to love one another. And he said, by obeying this command, he said, all men, meaning all non-Christians, will know that you are my disciples. In other words, according to Jesus, loving our fellow believers is the universal mark of a Christian. It is the one distinguishing characteristic. In fact, it's the only distinguishing characteristic by which all non-Christians are invited by Jesus to judge us as to whether or not we are genuine Christians. See, Jesus actually gave the world this right. He gave them a privilege. They're entitled to look at the lives of his people and see how we treat one another in order to determine if we are genuine Christians or phonies. They don't see us loving one another. They are absolutely entitled to conclude that we are not Christ's followers because those who follow Christ are to be characterized by Christ's selfless love. This is why Jesus made it clear in verse 34 that in giving this commandment to love one another, he was giving, he said, a new commandment. But note this, the actual command to love one another, that wasn't new. That wasn't new because there were many places in the Old Testament where, where God's people are told to love one another. We're commanded to love one another. But what made this commandment by Jesus new, it wasn't the words love one another, but the way in which we are commanded to love one another. See, Jesus gave himself as the standard, the model by which we are to love each other. He said, a new commandment I give to you that you love one another, but here's what he added. This is why it's new. Even as I have loved you that you also love one another. Jesus established himself as the model of love that we are to follow. And his love is that self-sacrificing of himself to others. It is a love that gives. It is a love that expects nothing in return, just gives and gives and gives. It is the love of 
of humble service that washes the feet of others. It is the love that puts others first and esteems others ahead of ourselves. And non-Christians have been given the right by our Lord to observe our lives to see if we are following his model of love. See, how we treat each other either gives us and the message of the gospel credibility and believability before a watching world as Christ, as Christ's true followers, or else it damages the cause of Christ. If we love one another in a Christ-like manner, then it testifies to the world of the truthfulness of the gospel, because it says to the world that the gospel really works. It isn't simply doctrine on paper. It works. It transforms sinners into saints. It brings people from diverse and sometimes even hostile backgrounds into the family of God where they get along as brothers and sisters and humbly care for each other. But if they see us bickering and fighting and holding grudges and failing to forgive each other, just constantly being angry and upset at each other, then it is reasonable for unbelievers to question the validity of the gospel and the claims of Jesus Christ, the claims to his claim to be able to transform lives. So by commanding us to wear this mark of selfless love, in essence, Jesus has put us on display for the world to look at and to evaluate. And folks, there is no better place for them to evaluate us than in the context of the local church. Because it is at the level of the local church where the reality of our faith and our sanctification are tested the most. See, local churches consist of people who are very different in personalities and backgrounds and skin colors and education and financial levels. And some, believe it or not, even have annoying character flaws. And yet, it is in the environment of the local church where we are forced to be together, not just on Sundays. If all your involvement is on a Sunday, you're not really a part of the church. If just for an hour and a half, that's it. With the church, <coughs> you're not really functioning as the church. We are forced to be together, to serve together, to work with one another, to worship together, to be involved in one another's lives and interact at all kinds of levels. And therefore, the local church then is the greatest laboratory and the greatest testing ground to determine if the gospel really works, if those who claim to be Christ's followers are really following him by loving each other as he has loved them. Now, for the last few weeks, we have been looking at the subject of the church, using our Lord's statement in Matthew 16, 18, I will build my church church. We've been exploring some of the, the various aspects related to how Jesus builds his church. Today we want to look at the issue of loving each other because according to Jesus, the church that he builds is to be made up of people who love each other just as he has loved us. Sadly though, what's often been the case is that Christians have been anything but loving, and their lack of love is so evident in their church life. Instead of being places where believers are noted for their love, so many Bible-believing churches have been known for their sinful skirmishes, unresolved conflicts, places where hatred and poor attitudes and open hostility are quite common. In fact, we're going to have our annual church business meeting in a little bit, but you know, that, is, um, that has been a place of horror for many churches be embarrassing for unbelievers to even be in a church business meeting, most of them. Instead of expressing the loving unity of the body of Christ, local churches have often expressed disunity and discord as they either experience splits and separations or else they stay together and they just continue to have all kinds of conflicts and, and clashes. We actually have an example of such a church like this in the New Testament, the church at Corinth was a very troubled church with a long list of problems. In Paul's first letter to them, he wrote for the purpose of correcting their problems, and believe me, there were many. For one thing, they were a divided church, 
They had settled into various cliques and factions based on who they considered to be their favorite Bible teachers. That's chapters one through four. In addition, there were a church that tolerated sexual immorality as they allowed one of their members to have an ongoing affair with his stepmother. We read about that in chapter five. In chapter six, Paul rebuked them for all of their lawsuits as they were routinely taking one another to court. In chapter seven, the apostle corrected them concerning some false thinking they had about celibacy and marriage and divorce and remarriage. In chapters 8 through 10, Paul enlightened them about how they were abusing their liberty in Christ by by participating in certain practices that were certainly allowable, but not wise because they were causing their brethren to stumble spiritually by violating their conscience if they were to participate in those things. In chapter 11, Paul scolded them for the sinful way they approached the Lord's Supper. Believe it or not, some of them were coming to the Lord's Supper drunk and gluttonous. And in chapter 15, Paul corrected them about their erroneous view concerning the doctrine of the resurrection. But it's in chapters 12 through 14, three chapters, where Paul devotes himself to correcting the Corinthians concerning the use of their spiritual gifts. And what is a spiritual gift? A spiritual gift is a certain gift that God gives believers to help them effectively serve him. This was a problem spot for the Corinthians because it's it's here and the use of their spiritual gifts that, that their sin of pride really surfaced. Some of these gifts were of a public nature and they had to do with being able to verbally proclaim God's word. Like, for example, the gifts of, of teaching and uh, preaching. And in those days, the, gifts, the gift of tongues. And then there are other gifts of a less public nature, and they're more behind the scenes oriented, like the the gift of helps, which is a general gift for just being helpful to others and, and showing mercy and encouraging others. Now, Paul taught the Corinthians that God sovereignly distributes these gifts. So it isn't up to any Christian to determine what gift they'll want, they want. Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 12, 11, but one and the same spirit works all these things Note this, distributing to each one individually just as he will. So it is the Spirit of God who distributes these gifts. We don't get our choice in what gifts we we want. And these gifts, Paul said, were given for the good of others. He said in verse 7 of chapter 12, but to each one is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. It's not for our sake, it's for the sake of others. But the Corinthians failed to heed Paul's teaching because it was here, as I said, in this area of spiritual gifts where attitudes of pride really surfaced, jealousy, resentment. See, rather than being content with the gift that God had given them and using their gift to benefit others, their egotistic selfishness kicked in, caused them to pursue the more showy, public, dramatic high-profile gifts, and in the process, they became jealous and envious of those who had had more high-profile gifts than they did. Others became boastful and bragging if they had these types of gifts, looking down upon those who had what they considered to be the lesser gifts. So instead of their gifts being used for the common good of others, they became a matter of pride for the Corinthians to show themselves off. And Paul summed up their problem in the first part of verse 31 of chapter 12, the very last verse in that chapter. At the beginning of that verse, he said this, but earnestly desire the greater gifts. Now, I want to just explain something and clarify something. The way this is translated in the Bible that I use known as the New American Standard Bible, but earnestly desire the greater gifts, it makes it sound as if Paul is commanding the Corinthians to desire the greater gifts. That's how it's translated. And by greater gifts, the more prominent public gifts. But that can't be what Paul is saying. It would be a contradiction to what he's just taught them in the chapter. He's already told them that God sovereignly 
distributes and bestows these gifts and that it's not up to them to determine which gifts that they have. So Paul certainly can't be commanding them now to desire the greater gifts. So what's the, what's the solution then? Well, there is another way to legitimately translate this verse that makes perfect sense. Instead of this being a command, it can be, and it should be translated as a, just a statement of fact. This doesn't violate the Greek text and grammar. It should be translating, it should be translated, you are earnestly desiring the greater gifts. That's what you're doing. And, and Paul's point in saying, is this, saying this is you are earnestly desiring the greater gifts, and wrongfully so. That's what you're doing. That's what's so wrong about your approach. That's why Paul continues this verse saying this, and I show you a still more excellent way. This more excellent way, folks, is the way of love, which Paul explains in detail in the next chapter, 1 Corinthians 13. In other words, instead of selfishly trying to outdo one another by coveting the more showy public gifts, Paul says, I'm going to show you a better way a more excellent way to live. And that way is the way of love. This is what you're doing. I'm going to show you the better way to live, the excellent way to live. See, 1 Corinthians 13 is the Bible's most detailed explanation of love. It's given in the context of correcting a local church simply because they were anything but loving. Instead of humbly serving others as Jesus commanded and thus demonstrating to the community, their city of Corinth, the genuineness of their faith in Christ, the Corinthians were just a lousy testimony, a lousy testimony to their community. And any unbeliever in the city of Corinth looking at them had to wonder how they could possibly even be Christians because they certainly didn't resemble their loving, selfless, giving Savior they claimed to follow. They were proud, boastful, selfish, and just plain full of themselves. And Paul's purpose then in writing 1 Corinthians 13 is to instruct them on the way that love behaves, which is not what they were doing. Folks, that's, that's my purpose too in teaching you this chapter because I, I don't believe for one moment that our church resembles the church at Corinth. But we are just as sinful in our hearts as they were. And we are just as capable of being self-focused and proud and boastful and jealous as they were. It may not be in the area of using our spiritual gifts, but we can express selfishness in any number of ways. And so if the mark of a true Christian and therefore the mark of a true Christ-honoring church is to love each other as Christ has loved us, then what we want to do is find out what exactly that entails. And that's what Paul teaches us in 1 Corinthians 13, because the way that Christ builds his church is for his people to follow the more excellent way of love. The approach that Paul takes in teaching us, the way he organizes his thoughts about love in this chapter is that first he tells us what life without love is like and what its true value is. And then he tells us how love behaves, how it acts. So this morning, we want to look at what life without love is like and its true value. So we begin with verse one. (laughs) Paul said, if I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, let's stop there. These words must have immediately captured the attention of the Corinthians because these were people who were so very impressed with those who had public speaking gifts. And Paul, knowing this, hypothetically presents himself as, as one person put it, as the world's most gifted tongue speaker, meaning, and tongues meaning languages. In other words, Paul presents himself as someone who has been gifted by God to be able to communicate, to speak with great eloquence, not only in the languages of men, but of angels too. Now, the point of the statement isn't for us to figure out what language angels talk. I have no idea what language angels talk. Whenever they are presented in the Bible as communicating with people, they always talk the language of that person. So that's that's not the point, because Paul is simply using hyperbole here. Hyperbole is an obvious exaggeration to make a point. 
So what is the apostle's point? Well, he tells us his point in the next part of this verse. He says, if I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but do not have love, I have become a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. Now, what Paul is saying is that even if he were the greatest public speaker in the world, if he, by speaking, was able to grip people's souls with with his words, able to capture their minds with his verbal eloquence, able to move an audience by his expressiveness, even if he were able to do all of that, yet if he didn't speak out of love and concern for those who were listening to him, eventually, no matter how good a speaker he was, all he would become to those listening to him would be an annoying, loud noise. A noisy gong, he said, or a, or a clanging cymbal. Now, folks, this is a profound truth. It's profound truth that Paul is teaching, and one that every Christian who has a teaching ministry at any level, adults or, or youth, ought to pay careful attention to. See, it's very possible to be an incredibly dynamic speaker and to initially impress people with your great ability to teach and communicate biblical truth and yet be nothing more than a loud, irritating noise. Not only to those who are sitting under your ministry, but also to God. See, that's exactly what God thinks of our speaking when it lacks love. It's just noise that's grating to him and grating to others. But that's exactly what what we are if we speak only to impress people as the Corinthians were doing. Their members love to speak publicly in order to exalt themselves as significant individuals so that they would draw attention to themselves. Listen, it was all for gratification of their egos because they didn't care about glorifying God. They didn't care about ministering to those who were listening to them. This was simply a solo performance Only for their sake, not for the ones they were teaching. It was loveless speaking, even if the content was true. It was loveless speaking. This is such an important issue for all of us to learn. For those who have been gifted to teach the word, we need to remember that our purpose in teaching must be to build up those who listen to us rather than drawing attention to ourselves by putting our gifts on display to impress them. According to the Apostle Paul, God has given us spiritual gifts for the express purpose of edifying, building up others, not ourselves. Let me read to you, uh, go back to 1 Corinthians 12, verses 4 through 7, what Paul said. Now, there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are varieties of ministries and the same Lord. There are varieties of effects, but the same God who works all things in all per- persons. What he's saying is that there's no one gift that's better than another. They're just varieties of gifts. And then he says, but to each one is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. It doesn't matter what gift you've been given, it's all for the same purpose, to bless others. Peter taught essentially the same thing in 1 Peter chapter 4. This verse 10 says this, as each one has received a special gift, he's talking about spiritual gifts, employ it in, note this, serving one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. You have a gift to serve one another, not serve yourself. Listen, if you care more about what those listening to you think about you than how you can help them by teaching them the word of God, then you are lacking in love. And you're just an annoying noise. We are never to teach for our sake, but for the sake of others. So, I ask you this, those of you who teach at any level, do you love those who you teach? Do you care about them? Do you care about their spiritual health? Do you pray for them during the week? Do you ever spend time just praying for them to receive what you're going to be teaching them? Or is it all about you? Is your teaching only a platform to give them information? Shouldn't be. Also, for those of you who don't teach but listen to others teach, be careful about those who you listen to. Because regardless of how eloquent, regardless of how impressive a speaker might be, if he or she lacks love, you don't want to sit under their ministry. It won't be edifying at all. Now, you may wonder, well, how can you tell if a speaker is loveless? Well, sometimes you can't because a lack of love is a heart issue, and we don't know anybody's heart. 
We can't read their hearts. We don't know their motivation. So sometimes it is impossible to know. However, sometimes it is. <laughs> sometimes public speakers will reveal their loveless hearts by talking far too much about themselves, telling you all kinds of stories that always seem to make them look good. Now, initially, you may be impressed with them, but eventually, that kind of self-centered me talk, it's going to start to grate on you and annoy you because they're nothing more than, as Paul said, an annoying, loud noise. In his book, Leading with Love, which I highly recommend, Leading with Love, Alexander Strzok says that when he teaches on the subject of spiritual gifts, he says he uses a very vivid illustration to get his point across. Here's what he writes. He said, I pull out from behind the pulpit a steel pot and a hammer and begin to beat on the pot as I talk about spiritual gifts and the need for love. At first, people laugh. They think it's a marvelous illustration. But I keep it up. While I'm banging on the pot, I just keep talking about spiritual gifts. Soon people aren't laughing or smiling anymore. They've had enough. They're annoyed. They're getting more agitated by the moment. But I keep on banging. When it seems, and I thought about doing this, and then I thought, I'll just read this. <laughs> when it seems that they can't stand it any longer, I stop and ask, are you annoyed? Are you enjoying this? Does it please you? Do you find it edifying? Would you like me to continue beating the pot for the remainder of the message? No one wants me to continue beating the pot. At this point, I remind them that this is what they are like to others and to God if they use their gifts apart from love. They're nothing more than a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. So folks, listen, love is not a side issue. Love is a central issue. Love is essential. Because without it, teaching in the church just becomes a grating, loud noise. But that's not all that a life without love is like. Because as Paul continues, he gives us another example of using one's gifts apart from love. Notice what he says in verse 2. If I have the gift of prophecy and know all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have faith so as to remove mountains. Let's just stop there. Once again, Paul is using, I remind you, this is hyperbole. He's imagining now he has the gift of prophecy. What is the gift of prophecy? It's the ability to proclaim God's truth, not simply forecast the future. It's the ability to proclaim the truth. We would call it perhaps preaching. And in addition to proclaiming God's word, he tells us he also has the spiritual gifts of wisdom and knowledge so that he understands, he says, all biblical mysteries, all biblical knowledge. Not stopping there, he imagines he has the gift of faith. The gift of faith is the ability to trust God for what seems humanly impossible, which in this case is the removal of mountains. Now, think for a moment. Think about how impressive Someone would be, if they really possessed all of these gifts, first of all, to be able to proclaim God's truth with an understanding of all mysteries and all knowledge, that would simply wow people. They'd be very impressed. They would put you on a pedestal because to have such theological knowledge would give you the ability to answer all of their questions, their deepest questions, to provide answers to those issues that they've wrestled with for years You'd have the answers. They, they would love it. Now, no one has this kind of knowledge, but there are some people who think they do. They think they do. And they would love to display to you how much knowledge they really have. And why do they do it? Not because they care about helping you to have an understanding, but because they want to look intellectually superior and smarter than others. In fact, the Corinthians were terribly guilty of this, and that's why Paul, back in chapter 8, verse 1, said this to them. He said, knowledge makes arrogant, but love edifies. What he means by this is knowledge alone. It's, knowledge in and of itself doesn't make one arrogant. It's knowledge alone, without love, that makes one arrogant. And, and arrogant means puffs up, while by contrast, love builds others up. Those who have knowledge without love 
They're proud. They're arrogant. They're haughty, the apostle says, because knowledge alone leads to intellectual snobbery, thinking you're better than, than those who don't possess your knowledge. Frankly, that is a danger that everyone who's a part of Lakeside faces because we are a church where biblical doctrine is emphasized every week. And if we are not careful, the knowledge of so much doctrine can lead to an inflated ego that makes one think that they are so much better than others who perhaps go to other churches who don't know as much theology as you do. And if that happens, then we are in danger of being a church filled with theological snobs who think they are too important to serve others. But the truth of the matter is that someone who has this kind of arrogance from being biblically knowledgeable has deceived himself, has deceived herself into thinking that they are better than others, but when the reality is that while they may think that they are more spiritual and they may think that they are better than others, they're actually nothing in terms of their usefulness to God, nothing. Their ministries count as zero, zip, zilch, nothing. Paul says, if I have all kinds of prophetic abilities and I'm able to understand all biblical mysteries and possess all biblical knowledge, but do not have love, I am nothing, he said. Nothing. Imagine thinking so highly of yourself and yet being nothing. Talk about deception. That's what loveless biblical scholars and loveless Bible teachers are. They are worthless to others because a loveless Christianity, no matter how brilliant it might be, doesn't minister to God's people. It simply exalts itself. As someone has wisely put it and accurately put it, a full head with an empty heart is worth nothing. That's exactly what Paul is saying. A full head with an empty heart is worth nothing. But look, going back then to verse 2, notice that Paul also speaks hypothetically of having the gift of faith, being able to trust God for what looks to be something impossible. Think of how impressive this gift would be. If you had the gift of faith so as to remove mountains, with this gift, one could perform all kinds of miracles. With this gift, one could pray for people to be healed, and they would be healed. With this gift, one could pray for needed money to come in, and it would come in. With this gift, one could courageously conquer difficult mission fields for Christ and overcome all kinds of obstacles. See, all of these accomplishments of faith would draw the accolades of others because they're spectacular. They're often supernatural. They're special. But Paul says that even these incredible displays of faith, if they are not accompanied by love, amount to zero. Nothing. And the reason for this is because the person involved in these displays of great faith would be doing them for the purpose of glorifying themselves. Look at me. That's it. Not enriching the lives of others. They would be exercising this great faith for the praise of men rather than for the praise that comes from God and the edification of his people. Listen, be very careful about those who claim to do great things for God. People who boast about these things, they are not spiritual giants. Those who are spiritual giants are humble. They don't boast about their accomplishments. So people who boast about these things, they're not spiritual giants. They are spiritual nobodies who are looking only to gain attention and prestige in your eyes. And sometimes they're saying these things to gain your money money as well. Paul says that as far as God is concerned, they're nothing. They're nothing. So a loveless life is nothing but a loud, annoying noise that accomplishes nothing, Paul says, of any spiritual value. But Paul isn't finished, because in the next verse, he speaks of still another hypothetical situation that would impress others, but would produce nothing of any value, nothing of any significance if it were done without love. Notice what he says in verse 3. And if I give all my possessions to feed the poor, and if I surrender my body to be burned, but do not have love, I am nothing. Paul has already talked about loveless preaching, 
loveless knowledge, and loveless faith. Continuing to talk now, he speaks about loveless giving. He's also speaking hypothetically. He's continuing to do that. Now he tells us he's hypothetically possesses the spiritual gift of giving. There is a spiritual gift of giving. What's that? It's the ability to give a great deal, a great amount. Paul presents then two pictures of extreme giving. First, he pictures himself in one grand sweeping gesture as selling all that he has, his home, his possessions, his clothing, in order to feed the poor. So now he himself has nothing. He's reduced to living in utter poverty. He's given it all away. What an incredible sacrifice he's made. But listen closely. Even this extreme sacrifice of giving all his possessions away means nothing to God if it isn't done out of love for his people. Now, I think it's reasonable. You may wonder how something like this can be done without love. I mean, why would you do this if you weren't loving? Well, people give away things all the time. And sometimes they make great personal sacrifices, but they do it not out of love, but in order to impress others with their generosity. We see this very clearly, by the way, illustrated in the biblical story from the book of Acts of Ananias and his wife, Sapphira. They were two members of the church at Jerusalem, and they gave their money away. Now, the story actually begins at the end of chapter 4, which helps to explain what they did and why they did what they did. Acts chapter 4, starting at verse 32. And the congregation of those who believed were of one heart and soul. This is the church at Jerusalem. And not one of them claimed that anything belonging to him was his own. But all things were common property to them. And with great power, the apostles were giving testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And abundant grace was upon them all. For there was not, listen to this, not a needy person among them. For all who were owners of land or houses would sell them and bring the proceeds of the sales. And lay them at the apostles' feet. And they would be distributed to each as any had need. Now, Joseph, a Levite of Cyprian birth who was also called Barnabas by the apostles, which translated means son of encouragement, and who owned a tract of land, sold it, and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. Now that's what was going on in the church at Jerusalem. People were selling what they had, and they were laying at the apostles' feet and saying, just distribute to the needy. Now, Ananias and Sapphira were members of this church. They saw all that was going on. They saw all the amazing giving that was going on, especially they would have noted the generosity of Barnabas. So they decided they would get in on this. So we read, continuing chapter five, starting in verse one. But a man named Ananias with his wife Sapphira sold a piece of property and kept back some of the price for himself and with his wife's full knowledge. And bringing a portion of it, he laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back some of the price of the land? While it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? After it was sold, was it not under your control? Why is it that you have conceived this deed in your heart? You've not lied to men, but to God. And as he heard these words, Ananias fell down and breathes his last, and great fear came over all who heard it. The young men got up, covered him, and after carrying him out, they buried him. Story goes on to say that this also happened to his wife, Sapphira, as she was confronted by Peter. See, their motive wasn't love at all, but recognition from their peers. They saw how everybody was impressed with those in their church who were generous in giving, and they wanted to cash in on that. They wanted to impress the people at their church, but they not only lied about the amount of money they received for their property, but they didn't care about the poor. They cared only about themselves, how they appeared to others. Now, in that sense, they were just like the Pharisees who Jesus spoke of in Matthew chapter 6. 
Verse one, he said, beware of practicing your righteousness before men to be noticed by them. Otherwise, you have no reward with your father who is in heaven. So when you give to the poor, do not sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites, referring to the Pharisees, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, so that they may be honored by men. Truly I say to you, they have their reward in full. Now the Pharisees, they gave money to the poor. They they did this a lot. But they did it, Jesus said, in order to be honored by men, to be thought of as men who were pious and generous and God-honoring. In other words, they, they wanted others, though, to think highly of them as just generous men, so much so that Jesus said that when they gave, they sounded a trumpet announcing to all the that I'm giving now, so watch this. What they were actually doing, they were announcing their righteousness. In reality, their pseudo-righteousness because they didn't give out of love. They didn't care for the poor. They gave out of a desire to impress others. Look at me. And if you're not looking, I'll blow a trumpet so you will look. They simply gave to draw attention to themselves. And that's why in the next couple of verses, Jesus instructs his disciples, us, to not seek any human recognition when we give. He said in verse 3, but when you give to the poor, you as opposed to the hypocrites, when you give to the poor, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving will be in secret, and your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. This is the way we are to give if we are truly giving out of love to help others. Far from blowing our own horn in looking for men's praise, Jesus said your giving should be so private that not even your right hand should know what your left hand is doing, lest these hands of ours should come together to applaud, applaud ourselves. Now, this doesn't mean that no one should ever know about your your giving, because some giving can't be kept completely confidential. And that's not even our Lord's point. His point isn't about the secrecy of your giving, but about the motivation behind your giving. It's the same point that Paul is making in 1 Corinthians 13. You can give away all of your money and possessions for the worthy cause, and it is a worthy cause, of feeding the poor. But if you are doing this to look good before others or or just to feel good about yourself, rather than out of love and concern for the poor, then according to Paul, it is of no value. He said, it profits me nothing. It's worthless. It's useless as far as God is concerned. There is no reward from God for giving that is loveless, no matter how great the sacrifice is. You wanted the applause of men, you got it, that's it. In fact, in the next hypothetical picture that Paul presents of extreme giving. He takes it a step further. He speaks of himself making the ultimate supreme sacrifice of his life. Notice he says, and if I surrender my body to be burned, but do not have love, it profits me nothing. And here Paul pictures himself as giving his body to the flames, meaning the flames of dying as a martyr for his faith. Burned at the stake, as so many Christians in church history would later experience. But, he says, even if he offers the supreme sacrifice of his life, but he doesn't do it out of love so that it might give courage to his fellow believers and be a gospel witness to unbelievers, then his martyrdom is worthless. Now, you may wonder, how could anyone give his body to to die for the faith and that not be something good? How could someone possibly lay down his life with the wrong motivation? Well, the answer is that there are some Christians who, to a certain degree, enjoy suffering for the faith. And they'll be happy to tell you how much they've suffered because it makes them look as a hero in your eyes. Their suffering for Christ enhances their reputation as someone who is highly dedicated, highly committed to the Lord. So, Their suffering is motivated then by a desire to be highly thought of rather than by love. Yes, you might acknowledge, you can see that, but suffering is one thing, dying is another. Why would anyone willingly die for their faith out of the wrong motivation? Well, it's been done, folks, plenty of times. Plenty of times in church history. Listen to these words from one 
Bible scholar who's familiar with church history, the actions of martyrs down through the centuries. He writes this, in the early years of Christianity, becoming a martyr became at times a means of achieving great fame. One historian comments, it soon was clear to all Christians that extraordinary fame and honor attached to martyrdom. Some martyrs, like Ignatius, were showered with adulation before their martyrdom. Not that Ignatius sought martyrdom for personal praise, but he illustrated that it could be a temptation to some to seek to be immortalized in the annals of church history as a martyr for Christ. Listen, even the ultimate sacrifice of giving your life, if it isn't motivated by love for others, God said, it is totally worthless. It's just a religious show, a performance to make you look good. Now consider what the Corinthians must have thought about these words from, from Paul, about the worthlessness of a life that is lacking love. That's where they were coming from. This must have just stunned them because this is, this is them. Everything Paul spoke of was a rebuke to them, their way of thinking, their way of, their way of living. That's why I said, I show you a more excellent way. Everything they did in using their spiritual gifts was done for the sake of impressing others. They were self-centered, they were selfish, and you know, here's the sad thing, they didn't even realize it. They didn't even realize it. Their pride had blinded them to their own sin. And the really sad thing about this is that all their service amounted to zero because God wasn't impressed at all. Others may have been, but God wasn't. Paul says that lovelessness produces nothing of value to God, and it receives nothing of value from God. Now, if you're a Christian, if you have been one who has been born again, you have turned from your sins, you have turned to Christ to save you, then you wanna learn from the Corinthians. And the lesson is simply this, don't be like them. Don't be like them. It's easy to deceive yourself like they did and think that you are doing great things for God in serving him when in reality your service isn't motivated by love for others. It's motivated by making you either feel good about yourself or look good in the eyes of others or perhaps even both. So examine your heart to see if your life, your service, and you should be serving, it goes without saying you should be serving. But examine your heart to see if your life and service are motivated by godly love for others. Get over yourselves. Think about others. Is it motivated by sinful love for yourself or godly love for others? And where it is motivated by sin, then all you need to do is repent. Don't go and retreat and get depressed. Just repent. Change your thinking and start being more conscious of serving others for their sake and not for your own. Now, next week we're gonna look and see what it means to love others. What does it actually mean to love others? But the truth of the matter is that no matter how loving you are, none of us has loved perfectly or will love perfectly except one, Jesus Christ. His love is perfect and the greatest demonstration of his love is his death on the cross on behalf of sinners. Unlike some of the martyrs of early church history who gave their lives to make themselves look good and to be remembered by others, Jesus gave his life solely for the sake of others, not himself. The Bible says, he who knew no sin, speaking of Christ, who had never sinned, he became sin for us. He became a sin offering. He died in place of sinners like us. As far as God the Father was concerned, he was a sinner. He was treated as a sinner, even though he had never sinned. So that we who are sinners and deserve to be treated by God's wrath, we who are sinners would get just the opposite. We would be counted for righteousness before God, the righteousness of Christ. In other words, Jesus gave his life as a sin offering so that God the Father would be satisfied with his death on the cross on behalf of sinners. And therefore, we could be and would be forgiven and credited with Christ's righteousness. This doesn't become a reality in your life until you repent, turn from your sin, and personally 
place your faith, your confidence, your trust in Christ alone for your salvation. I'm asking you today, pleading with you, if you've never trusted Christ, let this be the day of salvation. You don't know if you have tomorrow. Turn to the Savior. Recognize your sinfulness. Recognize his death on the cross for sin and trust him. He'll transform your life. He'll forgive you. He'll put his righteousness on your account. He'll make you a new creature in in him. He'll give you the capacity to love others. If you have no love at all in your heart, especially for God's people, you're not a Christian, the Bible says. So turn to Christ. Put your faith in him. I'm going to close in prayer, and then I'm going to turn things over to Robert Frere, who has recently become the chairman of the elders, and he's going to lead us in our annual church business meeting. Pray with me. Father, we thank you for these powerful words, your words through the Apostle Paul. Lord, help us to be those who love others, to be convicted of our sin. Lord, sometimes we're so proud. We love to brag. We love to tell others what great things we've done for you. And it looks so spiritual, but it's not spiritual. It's wicked sin. So I pray, Father, that you'll convict us. I pray for those who teach, the little ones, the older ones, adults. I pray that all of us, Lord, would care more about those we're teaching than about ourselves. And I pray, Lord, that you will help us to be mindful of loving others, of caring, of laying our lives down for them as you, Lord Jesus, laid your life down for us. And I pray for anyone here without faith in you, Lord. I pray that you would bring about salvation in their lives, grant them repentance and faith, and draw them to yourself. This we pray in Christ's name. Thank you.